So welcome everyone. I'm glad to be here. And I, I just checked whether my presentation is visible in this beautiful sunshine, but I hope it is, because I was searching very much for that little hat on the internet. So the idea of magic number for me came in last year when I was testing a project as a standalone tester. And for many, many reasons, there were a lot of bugs in the system. And we were not prepared for them. And I had to retest the whole system three times. Basically, it was a website, so it, it wasn't such a huge thing. And after the bugs were fixed and I retested everything, my business analyst asked that, how long do you want to still test this? And I checked the number of bugs at that time. And by using a cumulative function, I could tell that this is enough. And we went live, and we had no major bugs in production. And this is when I started thinking, as you can read in many books and articles, that how can you use the cumulative number of bugs for stating when testing is done. But let me start with the concept of excusing testing. We, are, we may know this testing principle. I, I'm citing from the foundations of software testing. Exhausting testing is impossible. It's, it's simple because there are a lot of factors which might affect the exclusive testing. For example, there are constraints on resources, time. It can happen that we have a few weeks for testing and the project is already, already scheduled, so we have to deal with these few weeks. Or we have personal constraints. We have not the right skilled people. We don't have enough testers. We have to separate the automated and the manual testers. So there are these kind of constraints. Also, we can have constraints on technology. It can happen that the test environment is not a complete copy of the production environment or that it can be set up issues. And also the cost constraints which covers basically everything because it's a matter of money, right? So what if you don't have a well-defined exit criteria? For example, you are a new guy, jumped in the project which is already running. You have to take it over from somebody. And you don't know what is the, the, the well-defined exit criteria is. Or you have one, but it turns out it's not useful during the testing or during the project life cycle. You have to come up with something, right? You are quickly doing a risk analysis, asking the colleagues, what is the most important function in the application, which is not so important, what should I start testing with, which are the most important test cases, and so on. Or you try to do a high coverage on the functions available. You're, you're going through the menus, you're going to the functions and try to test everything which is important. Or you try to ask for use cases, go through them, build your test cases upon that. And if you are done with this coverage, you can say that, okay, we are done with testing. And also, there is, a, there is this tool which you can use, which I call the magic number, where the increase of the cumulative number of bugs found seems to slow down. Be careful, there is no mention here about which increase. We will check an example on that. So I just drew a graph here. I hope it's visible. During a testing life cycle, the testers start the test. And the first day, they find two bugs. And the second day, third, zero, four, and so on. So this is a typical testing cycle, right? Testers are doing their work. And here, 
I'm calculating with the with the SEV1 and SEV2 bugs, so not the typos or setup issues, but the real good bugs, which can be found in the system, logic failures, and so on. At the end of the testing cycle, we found a few bugs. The graph doesn't really show the trends, so I put the same amounts to a cumulative function, so adding the numbers together. So at the first day, we are at two bugs, at the second day, at four. The third day, as you can recall, no bugs were found, so the function is flat and it's increasing. So which one is the magic number here? If we only see the first part of the graph, we can see that after the third day, the rays of the function stopped. So can we stop testing here? Well, it seems so. But if we go on, we can find that the number of bugs are ser going seriously higher. And on this graph, it shows that the testing can be stopped somewhere here. So the magic number here should be around 30, 35. Is this really so? Can we stop where the increasing is stopping? Well, it depends on a lot of factors. First of all, one of the assumptions here is that the, how the testers are working is kind of a linear way. So they start at the first day and nobody goes on vacation. Everybody is set up properly. They don't have to restart it from the beginning and they can go on with their work. In this case, this can be a good number to check. If not, if there are any kind of like vacations or drawbacks in the testing process, this is not a good, this is not a good uh, number. How can you use this number? and how the industry is using it. This screenshot is, is from one of the largest bug tracking system, and they are basically using it from status reports. As you can see, they even separate the active, resolved, and closed bugs, so you can have a good view on the system, and also you can see how the the raises are going. Based on these graphs and checking a similar projects, maybe on a similar system before, you can do a trend forecast based on these numbers. So for example, is there, is, there is only a small change in the system. You can get the latest cumulative bug number report from last year or from the last testing cycle and you can compare with it. If there is no big change, we can assume that the numbers will kind of be the similar. But of course, if there is a big regression bug or, or if there is a huge regression in the system, again, this number cannot be used well. And as I already mentioned, it can use for regression metrics. So if the number, in case of a small change, if the number is going really high, it means a serious regression there. Some researchers also use this number for the state of how reliable the system is. And in this IBM research I mentioned here, they even use the concept of bug density, which means the derivation of this function, because if the derivation is zero, then we reach the magic number where, it, where the function is flat. But when the derivation is positive, then it means that the function is still going higher, and it means that we, we still have work to do. 
So, what this number should be exactly? Because I started my presentation with the magic number. Do we have a, an exact number here? Well, it's easy to say zero is not enough, right? I know about a firm, a, a trend leading firm, where even when they are doing the simple regression test without any changes, they say that if the testers find zero bugs, then they are not work, doing their work properly because every system has bugs. And the environment is changing, the, the browsers are refreshing itself. It's a very common example. And if, if you find no new bugs, that it means that you were not thorough enough. Well, we can argue with that, but it's still an opinion. By my experience, it means, uh, sorry, I already mentioned these examples. So when I was working in, alone in smaller projects, which means that we are doing small websites and I was performing functional tests there. I thought that for this team, and we were working together since years, finding four, six serious logical bugs is good. I thought that finding these number of bugs means that we have a thorough testing and of course going through other, other indicators like coverage or exit criteria meant for me that the testing performed well. When I found 10 bugs, well, for me it meant pretty much. So something was not going well there. The requirements were faulty. The system was not designed well. So for me, 10 was a pretty much. Is it in your industry? We can discuss it later. Because this number, it heavily depends on the system. There can be larger and smaller numbers here. So you may already assume what the magic number is, right? Shall I tell it? I will tell it. So the magic number is four. Or 10. Or 42. Yeah, 42 is the answer for everything, right? Based on Douglas Adams' book. Or it can be 962. Again, this really depends on the system, on the industry, on the area you are working with. So the magic number can be anything. But who decides then what the magic number in the situation is? Because the magic number can be everything. Again, if you have experience in that area, you've been doing that testing before, and there is only a small change in the system. My assumption is that you can pretty much forecast what that magic number will be. And you can even say that, wait, we are on a catch here. The f this is not the, f the first magic number where the cumulative number of fa sorry the cumulative number of bugs are stopping. We we have to go further based on your experience. Of course, if you don't have that experience on that field, you cannot rely on this number. So the bottom line of my magic number is that you will decide what that magic number is, using your experience on the field. If you have any questions. So thank you for the presentation. Thank you. So any questions, maybe? I can see a lot of shining eyes full of questions. OK, 
Okay, Dan, I think I have a question. Uh, what was the highest magic number in your testing life so far? Again, uh, I was, when I was doing as a standalone tester, the manual testing, around 20, it was the magic number, but again, it was too high for me. So 20? Yeah, around 20. Okay. Uh, so you believe it's really high. So can you uh, think that, do you think that uh, it's possible that it's even higher or it can get even higher in your career one day? In the area I'm working with, I still think 10 or 20 is it's high, but I can, I can imagine that there are systems in where like 500 is the highest magic number because this, the system is built that way. So again, this depends on the industry and the area. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions maybe? Oh, I can see one. Great. Thanks. Uh, so for me, uh, it sounded like uh, that I as a tester have to set up this number or come up with uh, the magic number. And I'm just wondering, isn't it a, a product owner or a project manager or someone else from, uh, from closer from the business side who decides about the magic number? Thank you. I think planning it beforehand, it's, it's very risky. When I'm, when I'm using this indicator, I'm more like using it during the testing cycle and analyzing the trends and the numbers in a regular basis, and of course working together with the product owner, business analysts, and, and the others. So pre-deciding it, I don't think it would be very useful. But working together on it and checking this number, it, it can help getting on the same page on the quality of the product. Was it an answer to your question? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about from the risk perspective because the, um, as Rex Black said many times here in Hushtef and other conferences that, for example, this magic number can be assigned or, or, or uh, you know, made, uh, may, um, could be, or can be make a close connection to the risks. You know, the, uh, sever um, if you yeah, use course. a ca category of, of, of uh, bugs, then you can attach to risks, and uh, from this aspect, you can already make a planning beforehand, instead of during the test execution cycle. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm thinking why uh, you want to decide on the fly during the test execution about this number. Because that, that's a kind of uh, acceptance, right? Yes, yes. Still, I don't think it's, it's in, in my experience, on, in my area of work with who I am working together, it, it, was, it wouldn't be very useful to pre-decide it or set as a goal, more like leave it to the testers, what they see in the system. And I'm lucky enough to work with these kind of people who rely on my opinion and my colleagues' opinion and not only on the magic number or other indicators. So at the end of the line, at the end of the day, they always ask, okay, we heard the percentages, the numbers, the magic number, but what is your opinion? Can we go live or not? So I think this is a, a useful tool for that decision. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I see one more question. I have one question. This magic number is applicable for hardware testing ish? Probably, yes. I've seen and when I was preparing for the presentation, I could see a literature. But there is there any differences in the approach how you apply when you define this number is, uh, could be different because the hardware testing is more complicated than the software testing in some ways. If you, uh, for example, if you checking the chips uh, functionality. My first guess is that in this case, it, it, has to, it can be seriously higher. But again, I have no experience on that, so I'm really relying on your opinion there. Or, and we can maybe discuss it later on. I think the whole approach and the calculation there has to be a little bit different. 
and again the number can be higher. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so maybe we have time for one quick question. Anyone maybe? Well, if not, then thank you, Laszlo. Thank you.